In 1948, the Newfoundland and Labrador people were readying themselves to go to the polls. Their job was to decide which form of government would administer the country. Their choices were revealed on March 11, 1948. Commission of government for a period of five years. Responsible government as it existed in 1933. And confederation with Canada. The date for the referendum was set for June 3, 1948, just three months away. Two sides quickly emerged in the campaign. Those in favor of confederation with Canada and those who opposed it. The Confederates ran an effective campaign. They were well-funded, well-organized, and had a network that stretched across the island and into Labrador. They also had the tacit support of the British and Canadian governments. The Confederates' leaders were the charismatic Joseph Smallwood, a fiery journalist who had a gift for public speaking, and F. Gordon Bradley, a well-known and well-respected politician and businessman. Smallwood, Bradley, and the other Confederates campaigned hard and with considerable skill and confidence. They argued that Confederation would raise local standards of living by giving people access to Canadian social services. Confederate cartoons suggested that a return to responsible government would mean a return to the poverty and to the political scandals that had plagued local politics in the early 1930s. The anti-Confederate forces, on the other hand, were disorganized, and they were divided into two factions, the Responsible Government League and the Economic Union Party. The Responsible Government League, or the RGL for short, advocated for a return to the system of responsible government that had existed in 1933, before the Commission of Government had assumed office. Its supporters argued that Newfoundland and Labrador had a strong economy and could support itself as an independent nation. The RGL also warned that a Canadian government would not take proper care of the Newfoundland and Labrador fisheries. It said that because Ottawa would also have to worry about the other provinces, its attention would be too divided to do a good job. But a responsible government would only be answerable to the people of Newfoundland and Labrador. One of the most prominent members of the RGL was the businessman and journalist Albert Perlin. He used his columns in the Daily News to advocate for a return to responsible government. A great deal of nonsense has been talked of what Canada would do to help build our industries. We suggest to those who believe that statement that they look at the last issue of the Toronto Financial Post, where they will see graphically pictured the decline of industry in the Maritimes in inverse proportion to the rise of industrial output in the central provinces. What is there to induce Canadian industrialists to invest in Newfoundland that was not present during the past several years? The Confederates cannot say because there is nothing to say. Perlin admitted that confederation with Canada might become a reality in the future, but he insisted that a return to responsible government must come first. He believed that only an elected Newfoundland government could properly negotiate terms of union. The second anti-confederate group was the Economic Union Party. Led by the prominent St. John's businessman Chesley Crosby, it promoted the idea of a special economic relationship with the United States, a kind of free trade that would give Newfoundland exports access to the lucrative American marketplace. The EUP argued that this would allow Newfoundland and Labrador to remain self-supporting in the long term. But America displayed little enthusiasm for economic union, and the option was not included in the referendum. As a result, Crosby and his followers supported a return to responsible government as a first step towards future negotiations with the United States for economic union. Although both the EUP and the RGL opposed confederation, the two groups did not join forces. The anti-confederate campaign was disunited, lacked strong leadership, and was inadequately funded. But despite these disadvantages, there was a considerable amount of anti-Confederate support among the public, especially on the Avalon Peninsula. 
Business people tended to favor responsible government, and so did the Roman Catholic community. The Catholic Archbishop Edward Roach was a particularly fierce opponent to Confederation. He worried that it would endanger Newfoundland's system of denominational education and that Canada's permissive divorce laws would threaten the traditional Roman Catholic view of the family. On June 3, 1948, the Newfoundland and Labrador people went to the polls. When the results were counted, responsible government was the winner with 44.6% of the vote. Confederation was a close second with 41.1%. Commission of Government was a distant third, with only 14.3%. But that was an important number because it meant that there was no clear winner. No one side had gained more than 50% of the vote. About 55% of the people had voted against responsible government, and about 59% had voted against Confederation. A second referendum was needed, and it was set for July 22nd, this time, Commission of Government was dropped from the ballot. The RGL and EUP now joined forces, but they still remained disorganized and they lacked a strong leader who could counter Smallwood's charisma and conviction. In contrast, the Confederates entered the second campaign with energy and enthusiasm. They were convinced that most of the people who had voted for Commission of Government would rather Confederation over a return to responsible government. In order to win those additional votes, the Confederates adopted two new tactics. Both played into sectarian sentiments. First, they decided to emphasize the role that the Roman Catholic Church had played in the first referendum, which they believed would convince more Protestants to vote for Confederation. Second, the Confederates claimed that the members of the EUP were being disloyal and anti-British by wanting to strike up ties with the United States. They hoped this would strike a chord with the sentimental ties that many Newfoundlanders and Labradorians had with Britain. Confederation was presented as pro-British, and British Union became a new slogan. On July 22nd, 85% of registered voters went to the polls. The outcome was close, but Confederation won by a small margin, with 52.3% of the vote. In both referendums, the Avalon Peninsula had supported responsible government and the rest of the country had favored confederation. Reaction to the referendum results was strong on both sides. There was celebration among the confederates and sorrow among the anti-confederates. Some people flew flags at half-mast as a public show of mourning. But the process for confederation was now set in motion. A delegation was sent from Newfoundland to Ottawa to negotiate the final terms of union. The delegates included the leading Confederates F. Gordon Bradley and Joseph Smallwood, as well as the leading anti-Confederate Chesley Crosby. Much of the fall of 1948 was spent in negotiations, and the official terms of union were signed on December 11, 1948. Prime Minister Louis Saint Laurent signed for Canada, along with Brooke Claxton, the Vice Chairman of the Cabinet Committee on Newfoundland. All of the members of the Newfoundland delegation signed on behalf of the new province, with the notable exception of Crosby, who had objected to the financial arrangements. The new Terms of Union came into effect just before midnight on March 31, 1949. After fighting so hard to join Canada, Joseph Smallwood became the new province's first premier. It was an office he would hold for the next 22 years. <laughs> ¶¶